Hello. I'm sure many Amiga owners will have seen one of these before. This is the A520, a way to connect your Amiga up to your TV via its RF or composite video input, and I remember the picture not being particularly clear, but I bet you haven't seen one of these before. This is the Mamba, an aftermarket A520 alternative, and in this video we're going to take a look at both of them, see what they do, and then we're going to ask the question, why was an alternative needed? Was it any better, or was it filling some other purpose? So here I have an Amiga 500 Plus, yes, a working one. Now back in the day, there were several ways you could connect your Amiga up to a screen, and each method produced a different quality of picture. The first and most basic, well, you could use the composite video connector on the back of the A500. However, this was monochrome only, so no colour. The second was using the RGB port next to it, and there were several options here. Obviously you could purchase a monitor that would plug directly into this, but that was an additional cost and not everybody could afford that. This however would be the best quality. If you were lucky enough to be in Europe and you had a TV that supported the SCART connector, then you could use one of these RGB to SCART adapters that would give you a fantastic picture, assuming your TV would take RGB input. And indeed, my Philips monitor that I use here also has a SCART connector on the back of it. But when I was younger, I didn't have a monitor or a TV that could even connect via SCART, so I had to use the A520. No, that's not a road down south somewhere. The A520 takes the RGB signal and converts it into two different formats. One being colour composite video, but sadly, my TV didn't have a connection for this, and so I was left with the lowest quality option for me, connecting the Amiga via the RF signal directly into the antenna connection on the back of the TV. And this is how I used my Amiga for pretty much all of the 90s. The only problem with this approach was the A520 stuck out a long way out of the back of the Amiga, and had to be supported or it would fall out, meaning you'd need quite a large surface to set your Amiga up on. Now the TV I had wasn't the best of quality either, it was rather old, inherited and a little bit blurred, so I probably didn't realise just how bad the picture quality actually was. Now for reasons I'm yet to understand, there were also aftermarket TV modulators available made by a variety of companies, so let's have a look at this one. According to the Amiga hardware database, it's supposed to give you a slightly sharper picture than the A520. I don't know if that's via its RF output, video output or both. Anyway. By straining to look at the advert included, I can see that it retailed for just £34. I struggled to find really any other references to it, so let's take a closer look. Hmm, what a cool mug. Commodore A520 Owners Club. Don't hate, modulate. Well, here it is. Look, it comes with a two year warranty as well. Mind you, that's probably expired by now. Flipping the box over and looking at the back, it's got the same connections, although there's no frequency shift switch like the A520 has. However, there's nothing really on the box to indicate if this has any advantages compared to the A520 either, so let's open it up and we'll have a look inside the box. Well, we've got the main device and an antenna cable too. It's actually quite thick, so maybe a better quality than the original that came with the A520 anyway. Underneath that, we find a manual, well, more of a piece of paper really, and a registration card. Interesting, although I doubt the post office box is still there. Oh, and they ask what model of Amiga you're planning on using this with. The Amiga 600 and 1200 had modulators built in, so that's kind of weird, but then again, maybe this is just a generic registration card. Back to the manual, <laughs> look at this, the inside is printed upside down. What's that all about? Someone must have been having a real bad day at the photocopier. Anyway, taking a closer look, it's just telling you how to connect things up, and it's interesting to note it has a section about using it to record your Amiga with a VHS. Ok, so we've seen both devices. Next, I'm going to connect each one up to a lovely CRT to check they work and also to get a first look at the quality. Now the TV I'm using also supports composite video, so I can toggle that and you can see the difference. Just to note however, this is a really small TV. Starting with the A520, and you may have noticed on the back it has a little switch marked L and H. Well, these relate to 5.5 and 6 MHz frequency shift. This allowed you to avoid interference from other channels, although some people believed one of these settings actually looked better than the other anyway. To start with, this is the L setting. The strange lines and patterns you see on the screen are actually from the recording, you can't see these yourself. I'm now going to toggle the setting on the TV to video in, and you can see the picture does look a little more crisp. Now onto the H setting, and I've had to slightly retune the TV for this as you'd expect. But to be honest, on this TV at least, I can't see any difference at all. Onto the Mamba, and I'm going to use its RF cable too. 
It may be that because it's better quality, we may just get a better signal. Well, for some reason, that was much harder to tune in, and I personally don't think the signal is as good. But then, that could just be the TV. Oh, and here's the composite video signal again, which looks perfectly fine. Okay, so they both work. I suppose I didn't really expect them not to. But with such a small CRT, it's really hard to see any difference. Although, it's still very obvious how much better the composite video looked compared to the RF signal. To get a better analysis of this, I need to record the signals more directly from both of these modulators. This is much more tricky these days because it's not that easy to get an analogue TV tuner card for a modern PC. Well, at an affordable price, anyway. However, there's another way. I was going to use this VCR, but to be honest, the output from it is less than perfect, and so I really don't think it's going to help us very much here. I don't know if it's just ageing components, or the VCR just needs to go in the bin. Plus, it insists on outputting on a channel very close to what the modulators are outputting on as well, causing even more interference. And the VCR has absolutely no options to retune that. So I'm going to use a different approach. I've managed to get one of these. This is a WinTV USB stick that actually supports analog TV. So I'm going to see if I can tune it in directly, and this hopefully should give the best representation of the video signals from both devices. I've created this test card picture in high res interlaced, which should provide a good quality picture to test with. So here we go. This is the A520 booting up using the RF output, and I've let the WinTV device tune in automatically, and it's not that much of a terrible picture. Probably about as good as I expected. There's quite a bit of noise in the transitions between the colour areas, which also is to be expected, and there's quite a lot of noise in the solid regions too. Switching to the composite video signal, you'll see it's a lot clearer, but there's still this noise here. It's worth remembering that the RF signal will be generated from the composite video signal, so any noise that's on the composite video signal will get modulated into the RF picture. Now onto the Mamba. Again, starting with the RF output, and again, it looks reasonable. At a quick glance, it really doesn't look any better or worse on the A520. Now switching to its composite video, and we can still see some noise, a lot like before. So let's take a look at those images side by side, starting with the RF signal. And I have to admit, the picture quality is slightly better with the Mamba. You can see that there's less noise in the grey areas, and a lot less noise where the colour change is. Now let's take a look at the composite video signals, and you can clearly see that the Mamba has a less noisy signal. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about. You can quite easily see the difference. So, the question I want to know is why is it better? To do that, we're going to have to pull them apart. Starting with the A520, which is actually quite difficult to get apart, but I'm slowly working my way around it, and there it goes, it opens. I'm also going to remove the top of this shielded area too, because we want to have a look inside. Now onto the Mamba. Oh, um, that was easy. But it's screwed in, with, for some reason, just one screw. Let's get that out. And taking a quick look, Hmm, the back of this PCB looks really strange. It's not corroded or damaged, there just seems to be an excess of solder under the solder mask. Looking at PCBs like this reminds me that sometimes you need to have new ones made, and a good place to start with that is PCBWay, who kindly sponsor this video. Not only do they offer PCB manufacturing using a variety of different materials and colours, and all from as little as $5, they also include an assembly service too, meaning that if you're not so confident with the soldering iron, they can do all the hard work for you. Very handy with those tiny surface mount components. But you don't have to design your own PCBs, because they have a huge library of shared projects, where other people have created and uploaded their designs. As a fan of the Amiga, I counted over 200 projects dedicated to the Amiga alone. Once you've created your PCB, you're most likely going to want some kind of enclosure too, and PCBWay can help you with that by offering 3D printing, CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, and injection moulding services as well, making PCBWay a one-stop shop for all your needs. Thank you PCBWay for sponsoring this video. So, back to these modulators, and I've taken some photos so you can have a much closer look and we can explore them together. Starting from the bottom, both of them appear to have a logic chip of some kind at their input. However, they both seem to have different markings. But if you look up their datasheet, you'll actually see they're just the same chip made by different manufacturers, and these are dual D-type flip-flop chips, so nothing new here. Moving along the board, they both have a very similar set of components as well, just laid out slightly differently. And then we reach this chip, the MC1377P, which is a colour TV, RGB to PAL or NTSC encoder chip. Makes perfect sense that that would be here, and it's no surprise that they both use it. 
This chip produces a composite video signal directly at one of its pins. You can also derive an S video signal output from this chip as well, and there are some mods around the internet showing you how to do that. Beyond this chip, however, things start to change. This variable resistor on the Mamba actually allows you to change the RF frequency, rather than the switch, on the back of the A520. And Amitech opted to use the SL5067 video modulator chip to produce that RF signal, rather than the discrete components that Commodore hid in this shielded area. Aside from that chip, on the face of it, they're not actually that different. However, there is one difference that on first glance seems a little bit pointless. The Amiga's RGB video port provides several voltages, including 5 and 12 volts. The Mamba, however, has its own 5 volt regulator on board, powered from the 12 volt power supply. Now the only reason I can think of for doing this is then they can generate their own very quiet 5 volt supply, rather than using the potentially more noisy one floating around inside the Amiga. And this may be more than anything else responsible for the better picture. So let's have a look at the Amiga's 5 volt output compared to the one the Mamba is generating. Well, the top trace is coming from the 5 volt regulator on the Mamba, but look at the bottom one in blue. That's the 5 volts from the Amiga and it's a lot more noisy. Just a small note, however, the scope is set down to 20 millivolts, so these aren't particularly big disturbances, but when you're talking about analog video circuits, the less noise, the better. While we're looking at the Mamba, I'm just going to show you the other side a little bit more close up. Well, the top half is the A520 and the bottom is the Mamba. Huh, I've just noticed the Mamba doesn't even connect to the 5 volts on the Amiga. This pin here isn't connected. That's no surprise, I suppose. Now looking closely at the traces on the back of the board, I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but all those areas that look raised are solid, so I don't think they're damaged. Maybe this is to improve the ground plane in a further aim to reduce the noise, but then it also looks like there's a special coating over the top of it. If anyone knows what's going on here, then please leave a message in the comments. So I guess there really was a reason to go out and buy a better TV modulator for your Amiga back in the day, assuming your TV had a good enough quality to actually show the difference. I suppose there's a possibility that some of these may have been purchased for the Amiga 1000 or 2000 if you needed a colour composite video output or an RF signal. I can't imagine any of these were ever sold as replacements for failed A520s however. I've never heard of them failing. I wonder how many of these Mamba modulators were actually sold though. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.